Without placing too implicit faith in the account above given, it must be agreed that if a worthy pretext for so dangerous an experiment as setting houses on fire, especially in these days, could be assigned in favor of any culinary object, that pretext and excuse might be found in roast pig. So he says that uh, we don't know how far we can put faith in this particular story, that once upon a time people burned houses in order to roast pig. So he says, if at all that is true, he says, I, I fully agree. If there is any culinary object, culinary object is uh, some item that can be cooked. Culinary refers to cooking. So if there is any object that, uh, you know, is worth, even if you set a house burning in order to cook something, that object would definitely be big because it is so delicious. And uh, Charles Lamb seems to be a great lover of roast pig and he says of all the delicacies of the whole mundus edibilis i will maintain it to be the most delicate principus obsono obsoniorum so he says of all the delicacies the tastiest things in the mundus edibilis mundus edibilis is the world of delicious eatables okay the world of eatables edible things i will say that the best one, the chief of all delicacies, the princeps obsoniorum, that's a Latin phrase, both mundus edibilis and princeps obsoniorum are Latin phrases. He says, undoubtedly, roast pig is the chief of all delicacies. I speak not. Now he goes on to talk about what kind of pork he is referring to. I speak not of your grown pokers, things between pig and pork, those hobbledehoys, but a young and tender suckling under a moon old, guiltless as yet of the sty, with no original speck of the amor immunite, the hereditary failing of the first parent, yet manifest, his voice has yet not broken, and something between a childish treble and a grumble, a mild, the mild forerunner, a preludium of a grunt. So he says, see when I talk about roast pig, I am not talking about these huge full grown porkers, things between the pig and the pork, but he says, I refer to the young and tender sucklings, very small piglets under a moon old, hardly maybe just 15 days old, uh, under a moon no, old, maybe a very young, hardly a month old, uh, guiltless as yet of the sty. And they uh, don't, they still have not acquired the love for filth. Amor immunite is the fondness of filth. We know how pigs wallow in dirt. And so uh, this animal from its first parent, just like human beings have inherited the original sin of Adam and Eve, this animal too has inherited a sin from uh, his ancestors and what is that it is his love for filth but this baby pig has not yet been initiated into this love and so he is still pure and his voice again has not become a grunt of a pig but it's a mild forerunner a preludium of a grunt so it is that sort of a pig that must be roasted now he goes on to say, he must be roasted. I am not ignorant that our ancestors ate them seethed or boiled, but what a sacrifice of the exterior tegument. And he says, to cook pig, the best method is roasting. I am not ignorant because uh, some people used to uh, boil them. But then he says, if you do that, it's a way, it's a sacrifice of the exterior tegument. Exterior tegument is the crackling or the skin outside. So he says, when you uh, seethe or boil pig, what happens is there is a waste of the exterior, very delicious tegument or covering or skin. Charles Lamb goes on to wax eloquent about the taste of the roast pig. And he says, there is no flavor comparable, I will contend, to that of the crisp, tawny, well watched, not over roasted crackling. As it is well called, the very teeth are invited to their share of the pleasure at this banquet in overcoming the coy, brittle resistance. With the adhesive oligenous, oh, call it not fat, but an indefinable sweetness growing up to it. The tender blossoming of fat, fat cropped to the bud, 
taking in the shoot, in the first innocence, the cream and quintessence of a child pig's yet pure food. The lean, no lean, but a kind of animal manna, or rather fat and lean, if it must be so, so blended and running into each other, that both together make one, make but one ambrosian result of common subs or common substance. So he says that there is no flavor or taste comparable to the taste of a well-cooked crackling. And he says even the teeth take pleasure in eating. And teeth we know are made of bones and I mean calcium and it doesn't really feel any taste. But then in the case of crackling, even the teeth take part in this banquet when they help uh, to bite and remove the coy brittle resistance. And it is got an adhesive oligenes. Oligenes again is a word that means oily and it is fatty. And he says, no, please don't insult it by calling it fat. It is just a sweetness that has grown up to it. And it's just a tender blossoming of fat. It is fat cropped in the bud. It is not uh, the harmful fat of a grown up pig. And uh, it is uh, the cream and quintessence of the child pig's yet pure food because the child pig has not yet started eating any other food other than uh, its mother's milk. And so the lean, lean is that uh, part under the skin, the fatty part of uh, um, the pork meat. And so he says that all together they blend and form an ambrosian result. Ambrosia is the food of the gods. So this is heavenly, he says it's divine. Behold him while he is doing. It seemeth rather a refreshing warmth than a scorching heat that he is so passive to. How equably he twirleth round the string. Now he is just done to see the extreme sensibility of the tender age. He hath wept out his pretty eyes, radiant jellies, shooting stars. So he says that now uh, he talks about the process of uh, cooking the pig and so he is put on a string here the string can also be uh, the needle uh, the thick metallic pin on which you um, kind of which you on which you attach this uh, pig and it twirls you must have seen uh, how the uh, there is this rotating kind of a mechanism and there is fire from beneath and it rotates so that all parts are cooked equally well and then and see how passive he is the poor thing and uh, look at him how equably he seems to have a very equable a very friendly and a very pleasant kind of a character and just look at him he is lending himself to uh, the heat and he's getting done quickly and then he says see him in the dish his second cradle how meek he lieth and now he is cooked and he's placed on a plate and, and look at him he lies there how meekly as if he is in his second cradle. Wouldst thou have had this innocent grow up to grossness and indocility which too often accompany mature, mature find out. So he says how beautiful, how sweet, how innocent this cute animal looks as it lies cooked on the plate. And he says would you want this animal to grow up into a huge, fat, gross, ugly pig? 10 to 1, he would have proved a glutton, a sloven, an obstinate, and disagreeable animal, wallowing in all manner of filthy conversation. From these sins, he is happily snatched away. So he says, indeed, this animal is fortunate because if he had grown up, he would have become an ugly animal, a gluttonous animal, an obstinate and a disagreeable animal. But he has been saved. And again, from filthy conversation in the sense, he would wallow in filth. Now he is happily snatched away from all these unpleasant eventualities. Our sin could blight or sorrow fade, death came with timely care. Now this, uh, li these two lines are taken from Coleridge's epitaph on an infant. It goes on like this. Um, so this is how the whole thing, four lines. Our sin could blight or sorrow fade, death came with timely care, the opening bud to heaven conveyed and bade it blossom there. So uh, this was written on the death of an infant and an epitaph is a, uh, something that you write on the gravestone where the person is buried and so this is what uh, Coleridge wrote he said that the child let us you know console ourselves with the realization that the child has the death has taken the child away and he will be taken he's just a butt but he is taken to heaven and there he will bloom 
So uh, he says, um, so let us not worry about this little pig being cooked because he has been saved from great hazards. And his memory itself is odoriferous. No clown curseth when his stomach, while his stomach uh, half rejecteth the rank bacon. No cold heaver bolteth him in reeking sausages. He had the fair sepulchre and the grateful stomach of a judicious epicure. And for such a tomb might be content to die. So he says, it is only a person with a refined taste. A judicious epicure. Epicure is a man of pleasure. Only a man with a refined taste would choose to eat such perfectly cooked meat. A clown or a um, coal heaver, a man working in the mines, they have no choice and they don't have a refined taste either. They would eat even reeking sausages. Uh, and so they would curse the meat that they eat. But this kind of young roast pig will be eaten only by a, a judicious epicure, a person who really appreciates the taste. And so his stomach would be a sepulchre. Sepulchre is a resting place or a shrine. And so that would be a wonderful place for the uh, roast pig to finally reach. And one can even die for such a tomb. And then he says that he is the biggest, he is the best of sapors. Sapors means flavors. Of all the tastes, this is the best one. And he makes a comparison with pineapple. He says pineapple is great. She is indeed almost too transcendent. He compares pineapple to a woman. She is a, a delight, if not sinful, yet so like to sinning that really a tender, conscienced person would do well to pause. Now, those who have re eaten the pineapple, they know that it has a very sharp tinge to it. And it is sometimes very sweet, sometimes a bit uh, uh, kind of, it's got a, a, a sharp twist to its taste. And it is too ravishing for mortal taste. She wounded and excoriated the lips that approach her. And so she is sometimes the taste of pineapple sometimes too good. And uh, pineapple also sometimes irritates the skin, it wounds, it creates a burning sensation or an itching sensation in your mouth when you eat it. And like lovers kisses, she biteth. She is a pleasure bordering on pain from the fierceness and insanity of her relish. But she stoppeth at the palate. She meddleth not with the appetite. And the coarsest hunger might barter her consistently for a mutton ch chop. So it is true that pineapple has got excellent taste, but then uh, that is where she stops. She cannot satisfy hunger, the appetite. So a hungry man would definitely choose a mutton chop instead of a pineapple. Might barter or exchange her for mutton chop because pineapple can never bring down your hunger or satisfy your hunger. Whereas pig, that is not the case at all. Pig, let me speak in this, his praise, is no less provocative of the appetite than he is satisfactory to the criticalness of the sensoris, sensoris palate. The strong men may batten on him, the weakling refuseth not his mild juices. Whereas in the case of a pig, a roast pig, it is suitable for all, even the most sensoris people who criticize the others. Even they, even such people will have nothing to speak ill of about the roast pig. A strong man can eat and fatten himself with uh, this meat. And a weakling who doesn't eat much can just eat the juicier parts and satisfy himself. So it is agreeable on all sorts of stomachs. Unlike, unlike to man's mixed uh, characters, a bundle of virtues and vices inexplicably intertwisted and not to be unraveled without hazard, he is good throughout. No part of him is better or worse than another. He helpeth as far as his little means extend all around. He is the least envious of banquets. He is all neighbors fair. And he says, again, he makes a comparison between the roast pig and a human being. And he says, every man, any man you take for that instance, is a bundle of good and bad, virtues and vices. And these traits are in, inexplicably intertwisted. You can't really separate one from the other. But in contrast, roast pig is good throughout. There is not a bad bone or an evil bone in him. Every part of him is tasty, whether it's the crackling, whether it is the bacon, any part is um, tasty. 
and as far as he can help, he's a tiny fellow, but as far as he can help, he helps. And he's all neighbors fair. Everybody likes him. I am one of those who freely and ungrudgingly impart a share of good things of this life which fall to their lot to a friend. I protest, I take great interest in my friend's pleasures, relishes and proper satisfactions as in my own. Presence I often say and dear absence. Yes, presence. So here in this paragraph he says that I am a kind of a person who readily shares all good things in life with my friends. Whatever I get, I always think of my friends. And he believes that presence and dear absence. So Elia says that he is more than happy to share all that all the good things that he gets with his friends. And so, whatever he gets, sometimes he, somebody might gift him, give him presents of hares, partridges, uh, barn door, chickens, capons, flowers, all sorts of delicacies. And I dispense as freely as I receive them. So he says the moment he gets something like this, he immediately gives them off to his friends. I love to taste them as it were upon the tongue of my friend. So when he gets anything that is tasty, he is happy to taste them through his friend's tongue in the sense that he is happy when his friend also has a share and tells him about the taste. But a stop must be put somewhere. But he says even my magnanimity, my concern uh, for a friend, definitely there is a limit beyond which even I can, can't go and one would not like Leah give everything. So uh, Leah, here the reference is to King Leah. So uh, King Leah deprived his most loving daughter of everything and gave everything to the other two daughters who ultimately uh, ended up being um, very cruel and unloving. So he says, I would not like, one would not like Leah give everything. I make my stand upon pig. Me thinks it is an ingratitude to the giver of all good flavors, to extra domiciliate, to send out of the house, slightingly, under the pretext of friendship or I know not what, a blessing so particularly ad adapted, predestined, I may say so, to my individual palate, it argues an insensibility. So he says, I would give anything to my friends, but the only thing I will not part with is pig. because. It would be a sin, it would be a great ingratitude to the giver of all good flavors, that is to God. To extra domiciliate means to uh, send out of the house slightingly under the, under the excuse of friendship. I cannot insult, a friend is not greater than God, I can't insult God and again God has given me a blessing because my uh, palate, my taste is especially made to appreciate roast pig. So it would be terribly a wrong thing, it's, it would be a terrible wrong to give away the roast pig which I have received. That I would never do. So there he tells us how he is so fond of pigs that he will never under any condition part with uh, a piece of roast meat, roast pig that he has received. And then he says, I remember a touch of conscience in this kind at school. So he says, I remember an incident of this kind at school and he talks about his good old aunt. So here it refers to Aunt Sara who was uh, his father's sister and I will just uh, quickly paraphrase this part for you. And so when he went there to stay for the holidays and whenever he returned, she would give him something, some kind of sweet meat or a nice thing, she would stuff it into his pocket. And that particular evening, she gave him a smoking plum cake, fresh from the oven. And on the way to school, over the London Bridge, a grey-haired old beggar saluted him. And he says, I am sure he was a fraud, counterfeit is a fraud, an imposter. And I had no pence, means I had no money with me, pennies, pence with him. And so, in the vanity of self-denial, the very coxcombry of charity, coxcombry is foolishness, of charity, school ball, boy like, oh, I gave him a present of the whole cake. So what this boy did was, because he had no money with him to help this man in a very school boy like manner and thinking that he is doing some great good, he gave him the whole cake, the cake that his aunt had given him. He walked for a little time feeling quite happy, buoyed up, feeling that he had done a good deed but by the time he reached the end of London Bridge, he burst into tears 
thinking of how ungrateful he had been to his aunt and because the aunt had baked this cake with so much of love he had been with his aunt right from the time of the mixing he had waited it to come out of the oven and the aunt would be so happy thinking that he ate the cake which she had baked exclusively for him and now what had he done he had given it off to some fellow that he had seen on the road and he felt so bad about what he did and uh, he blame i blamed my impertinent spirit of arms giving and out of place hypocrisy of goodness and above all i wished never to see the face of that insidious good for nothing old gray impostor so he hated himself for his arms giving out of the way he shouldn't have done that and for his feeling of hypocrisy of goodness uh, for for thinking that this is the way you do good things and he also never wanted to see the face of that insidious means cunning and deceptive good for nothing old gray impostor never ever in his life again he was so unhappy with himself so he gives this example to justify uh, his uh, you know uh, reluctance to part with roast pig because that shouldn't be when people give you something with love you can't just give it off to somebody else so just like he gave off the cake he will never ever give off roast pig which god has given exclusively to him to him to suit his tastes our ancestors were nice in their method of sacrificing these tender victims we read of pigs whipped to death with something of a shock as we hear of any other obsolete custom the age of discipline is gone by or it would be curious to inquire in a philosophical light merely what effect this process might have towards incinerating uh, and dulcifying a substance naturally so mild and dulcet as the flesh of young pigs it looks like refining a violet yet we should be cautious while we condemn the inhumanity how we censure the wisdom of the practice it might impart a gust to so he says he has um, generally our ancestors have been nice in uh, sacrificing this they have been soft on these pigs when they kill them but i have also heard of uh, people whipping pigs to death before they get cooked and he finds it quite shocking but he wonders whether there is any incinerating effect incinerating is uh, something that makes something soft and tender so was it done this beating uh, to death whipping to death was it done in order to soften the meat we don't know but then why would you do that to soften the flesh of young pigs which is already so soft it looks like refining a violet a violet is a flower of such perfection what can you possibly do to make it more refined same way what can we do to uh, make the flesh of uh, a young pig more tender i don't know he says in the next paragraph he says i remember an hypothesis argued upon by the students while i was at saint omers now saint omers is a jesuit educational institution in france and he says there once there was an argument about this uh, issue and whether supposing that the flavor of a pig who obtained his death by whipping per flagellationem extremum extreme flagging superadded a pleasure upon the palate of a man more intensely than any possible suffering we can conceive in the animal is man justified in using that method of putting the animal to death so this was uh, the topic of argument if this whipping death by whipping can add the pleasure of or the taste of uh, a pig flesh is it wrong is it can it be justified uh, of uh, putting this animal to death in such a cruel way and so this topic was discussed but he says conveniently i forgot the decision i don't remember what exactly the final decision was and then in the end he also says in the last paragraph one when you serve uh, the roast pig they uh, an accompanying sauce would also be served and you should be careful about the sauce he says decidedly a few bread crumbs done up with his liver and brains and a dash of mild sage sage is a uh, aromatic herb uh, which is used in cooking and you can use some bread crumbs and also the liver and brains of this uh, pig can be made into a mashed into a sauce but he tells dear mrs cook please banish i beseech you the whole onion tribe never use onions when you serve me at least 
uh, tender roast pig. Barbecue your whole hogs to your palate, steep them in shallots, stuff them out with plantations of rank and guilty garlic. You cannot poison them, or more, make them more stronger than they are. But consider, he is a weakling, a flower. So he says, if you are cooking a full grown hog or a pig, you can add any amount of shallots. Shallot is a small onion. And you can also stuff them with entire plantations of the rank and guilty garlic. I guess uh, he, Charles Lamb is not very fond of the taste of onions or garlics. So he says when you're cooking a full grown big fat uh, pig, you can add all these to flavor um, the dish. But he, because they are already poisoned or already strong, they have a strong flavor already. So you cannot spoil it with onion. But then when we are talking about a, a young pig, a tender piglet, he is a weakling, a flower. So don't please, please don't add onions, any of the onion tribe, whether it be shallots or garlic, do not add any of these and spoil the flavor of this poor little creature. So that is how he ends the essay and you can say that indeed this is a detailed dissertation on the roast pig. He began saying how uh, this uh, practice of roasting pigs started and then he tells us about what kind of meat is best for roast pig. He tells us about the flavor, about the taste and about finally even about the sauce that has to accompany roast pig. So it is definitely a complete study on roast pig and that is why he gives it the title a dissertation upon roast pig so as i mentioned earlier though the essay might be repulsive to some it is indeed an interesting essay